So my name is Anna and together with Payam, uh, my colleague, um, we will be talking today about Immersive Tangible Landscape, um, which is a project we develop um, as members of geo for all laboratory. Uh, and we developed it to make a landscape design process more effective through the use of tangible interfaces, um, immersive uh, environments, and geospatial analytics. Our lab is part of uh, Center for Geospatial Analytics, CGA, uh, which is focusing on uh, education and interdisciplinary research and has been instrumental in uh, getting this uh, research done. Uh, so in the first part of the talk, I will give you an overview of what is tangible landscape. Um, with tangible landscape is a, a tangible interface for GIS. Uh, and we have been developing this for a couple uh, years now. And then Payam uh, will, um, will tell you about the newest coupling uh, of Tangible Landscape with immersive virtual environments. And uh, he will explain how this uh, coupling enhances the current, uh, current approaches to design. So why we are interested in tangible interfaces? So you're probably familiar with the scene where you are trying to solve some geospatial problems uh, together in front of a screen using mouse, uh, keyboard, uh, or even touch screen. And it's really hard to uh, manipulate uh, two-dimensional and especially three-dimensional data. Um, manipulation of uh, data usually requires some knowledge of some specific software uh, and um, also, usually only a single person can uh, navigate and manipulate the data, uh, which hinders the collaboration and creativity. So uh, about 10 years ago, uh, researchers from MIT Media Lab uh, tra were trying to address this type of problem. And they developed uh, the first, uh, first prototypes of environments which coupled uh, 3D physical models uh, with, um, with analysis. My advisor, uh, Dr. Helena Mitashova, uh, was collaborating with them and she, uh, she developed a similar system linked uh, to GIS. Uh, so, because uh, we needed to uh, support modeling and analysis of real world landscapes. Um, however, the system uh, here on the, this image, used uh, fairly expensive uh, and very heavy uh, laser scanner. Uh, so that kind of uh, limited the broader usage of this system. So the breakthrough came uh, with uh, the new generation of uh, 3D scanners, such as Microsoft Kinect and others. Uh, so several systems were developed using Kinect, and uh, most of you, or some of you, probably know uh, this um, augmented reality sandbox develop developed by Keck Caves at UC Davis. Uh, you might have seen this, uh, this system at conferences or museums, where it usually generates a lot of uh, interest and excitement uh, among children as well as adults. Um, so we were able to take advantage of the fast and quite accurate scanning of Kinect. Uh, and we developed the first uh, system with real-time coupling of uh, 3D physical model and uh, GIS. So this video should give you an idea how it basically works. Uh, so you, uh, this is a model of a real place. You, you change, you change the sand, uh, modify the topography, and this is then translated into the changes um, in the water flow pattern. So you get instant feedback. Um, so how does the system actually work? So you have the, uh, the 3D physical model, and this is scanned uh, by Kinect, and uh, the data is sent and imported into GRASS GIS, uh, where we create a digital elevation model, and we run uh, the selected uh, geospatial analysis, and uh, we create um, like a composite image map, which is then projected back on the model. So in this way, we couple uh, the 
3D physical model with the digital representation through a cycle, through a continuous cycle of uh, scan modifying, scanning, uh, computing, and projection. So just a brief um, overview of the software behind this. So Tangible Landscape is implemented around GrassGIS platform. Uh, GrassGIS is an open source uh, multi-platform uh, uh, geographic information system, uh, which provides a variety of simple to more complex uh, tools, hydrology tools, um, uh, remote sensing, network analysis, and so on. And, um, uh, the software of Tangible Landscape has three main components. Uh, the first one is r.in.kinec, which is a C++ add-on, which handles actually the uh, scanning uh, and creating the digital elevation model. Uh, then there is the Tangible Landscape plugin, which is embedded in GRASS uh, GIS uh, graphic user interface. And um, that's a dialog where you can modify different scanning parameters, for example. And then there is a third component, which is a Python file, uh, which, um, where you have all your uh, analysis, uh, which are in, as functions, which are called every time a new scan comes. Uh, and we provide a library of uh, analysis you can use right away, but you can also uh, quite easily develop your own uh, work, geospatial workflows using GrassGIS Python API. So, so far you have seen um, just how we sculpted sand with our hands, where we modify the continuous elevation surface. Uh, but many applications uh, we were thinking of require different types of data, uh, like vector data, points, lines, polygons. Uh, so uh, to make tangible landscape more flexible uh, in this regard, we, we developed uh, different types of interactions. So for example, the interaction with uh, with placing markers, uh, the markers are identified and can be interpreted as points, uh, as viewpoints or trailheads uh, for different applications. Uh, we also are experimenting with using the color information coming from Kinect. Uh, so you can uh, draw different shapes or lines with, um, with laser pointer. Um, and here we use um, colored sand uh, where uh, you can form different uh, shapes, uh, and the height of the uh, of the sand can represent intensity of uh, of that polygon of the property. Um, and also, we are have recently tested using um, s like pieces of cloth or felt to, for example, design like changes in uh, land use pattern. Uh, so these interactions can be combined um, to achieve uh, the appropriate um, intuitive interaction for specific application. So I will give you just a short, um, short list of different applications uh, we were uh, working on. Uh, so here um, we actually uh, use these markers to explore uh, visibility. So this is NC State Campus and the model is, uh, represents um, it's a digital surface model. So there are trees and buildings. And by placing the marker, you, um, we identify the place, compute dynamically the view shed, and display it on the model as the yellow area. So that's an easy way how we can explore visibility patterns. Uh, this is a, a mo much more complex model um, uh, we are using this. So we coupled tangible landscape uh, with an uh, urban growth model called Futures, which was developed uh, at NC State. And here we uh, interact with the model in the way that we place these different um, uh, sand as a, and we create basically zones. So the red, uh, the red zone um, uh, supports more development while the green zone is more for conservation. And we rerun the model with these uh, new initial conditions. And you can see there's um, much more development uh, in that zone. So you can... Um, you can use this type of environment for uh, engaging, uh, for example, stakeholders uh, and use it as a kind of decision-making tool. And recently, there has been a lot of interest also in um, 
in um, serious games and how uh, they can be used uh, for engaging public in science. So we thought uh, Tangent Landscape would be a good platform to do that. So um, we developed this coastal flooding game uh, where, and we brought it to a public event where people were trying to protect uh, homes uh, during storm surge flooding uh, by building uh, barriers from sand. Uh, and then uh, we simulated a break uh, in the dune and then it floods and here they can see like how many homes were actually flooded in round one and then have new chance and try different type of configuration um, and see uh, which configuration would be most efficient for saving homes. So and now at this point, um, Payam will tell you about the immersive part. Good afternoon, everybody. So as you have seen so far, tangible landscape represent a landscape in a kind of projected augmented 3D view that you can see it kind of bird eye perspective. We wanted to complete this picture by representing the landscape and how it looks like from a human scale perspective. So uh, why we did that? First, we wanted to have a more tangible communication with people. It's very important because you need to translate the abstract representations on the map to what we actually seen in the environment. So it promotes a kind of more understanding involving decision makers, stakeholders into the process. The second, uh, which is also important, is to bring designers into the table. To, uh, to include attributes that they care about, uh, coherence of the landscape, composition of the landscape, the things that they really care about, which is not uh, readily available from the 3D perspective of the bird view. And third, uh, to our, as we know, to, with our given kind of understanding of how human perception of landscape influences the mental health, psychological well-being of people, it's very important to understand how the ecological health of landscape can be balanced with the psychological health. So you can have the trade-off between the people's perception and uh, ecological integrity at the same time. So what is virtual, um, immersive virtual environment? IV is a technology that surrounds users with continuous stream of stimuli uh, tied to the user's head or body, uh, creating a feeling of physically being present in a non-physical world. Uh, it has been shown that this uh, technology has a high degree of presence and it's very, very um, robust tool for assessing people's perceptions. So the, the rationale behind the coupling is based on the adaptive 3D modeling framework. The idea was to generate um, a georeference 3D model um, of 3D world of the understudy landscape in which all the elements, the attributes, and the, their behavior is tied to the corresponding uh, object in the tangible landscape. Um, we wanted to also enable user to control the viewpoint so they can actually point where they want to stay in the landscape and how they want to navigate within the landscape. Uh, so for implementing the concept, we just added, um, um, we just added a, a 3D modeling and a game engine software and also um, a head mount and display to the setup. As you can see here, we just need to have Blender added which is um, a game engine software and 3D modeling, and also the headset, and you can have a display on. So what is Blender and why we use Blender? Blender is a free and open source program for modeling, uh, rendering, simulation, animation, and game design. Uh, the reason that we were very interested to use Blender was not only about being open source and free, but also about having an internal Python environment IDE, so it can allow you to flexibly program it. And also it has a plugin for GIS, so you can, uh, you can bring in the georeference models into it so it can link it directly to tangible landscape. And it has high quality um, and very robust rendering at the viewport, so it doesn't need post-processing and rendering for creating realistic environments. Briefly describing the, the workflow, GrassGIS and Blender are loosely coupled through a file-based communication. Um, as, as user interacts with the tangible user interface, um, GrassGIS sends a copy of the data, along with the simulation, if needed, to the Blender. We implemented a, a module inside the Blender environment, uh, which monitors and handles the event inside. So as soon as it receives the file, uh, it, it identifies the type of uh, adjustment made in the tangible landscape and, um, and applies it and applies operations and modifiers needed to adapt the object into the 3D world. And then the Blender scene is in the real time, is, uh, has an output to the 3D viewport. You can see it on the display and also head-mounted displays like, like Oculus. 
So for example, you can see that when landscape is manipulated um, with hand, agility thruster is exported to, to the, uh, from the grass to the blender and ad adapted. And also at the same time, um, the, the polygon related to the water is also um, adapted. So you can see this is Anna's hand here, which is in real time translating the 3D model. So it's, uh, it, it happens in seconds and it's real time. Uh, while anytime during the interaction user can uh, freely navigate in the environment using the mouse, they can also use a laser pointer to delineate their, uh, the, the place that they want to be in the landscape. So they can point, I want to be here. It's, uh, it translates into a line feature. So a line feature is inter interpreted as two points where the first one is where you want to stay in the landscape and second one, your direction in the landscape. And it's translated in the camera into the blender. At the same time, as, as polygon features can be drawn in, uh, for, to delineate um, tree patches, where Blender understands it and, uh, of course, uh, populates uh, trees in it, and you can apply textures, um, and it automatically applies textures afterwards with the lightning. So as, um, as mentioned before, the Blender viewport is continuously displayed in both viewport and head mountain display. So anytime during uh, the interaction, user can take, up the, uh, take the Oculus and then get immersed in the environment. So for demonstration of the application in action, we'll go through a small video where um, our colleague Watslav collaboratively with Anna designs a landscape. This is our first prototype, so the realism of the scene is not what we have now. But it shows per perfectly how the ecological, um, ecological aspect of landscape and aesthetic, uh, um, and aesthetic aspects are uh, assessed in, the, in, in parallel. So they collaboratively, uh, they collaborative, collaboratively built the model, and you can see they, uh, they made three, um, three mounds and also uh, three lakes, which is in real, real time updated in 3D model. And now they point uh, a laser pointer where they want to, with a laser pointer where they want to stay in the landscape. And next, uh, Washek tries to use the laser pointer interaction uh, to delineate uh, trees. Now first he uh, experienced it through uh, IVE. And now we can see he draws the patches, which is emerging there, and then the second one and then the third one here. So anytime, this is a 3D model, anytime during the interaction, you can uh, navigate with the mouse and experience it. At the same time, it can um, use the IVE to get immersed in the environment. We also took benefit of the tangible, um, uh, tangible objects like place markers that delineate the checkpoints in a path. So if you want to design a trail, uh, Grass GIS simulates, um, simulates a least cost pass that gives you an idea how you want, how would be the, um, the optimized pass. But at the same time, Washik uses um, laser pointer to adjust the pass to make it more aesthetic, to meander between the trees. So you can see the trade-off between these two at the same time. And now the, um, and now the, uh, the pass is kind of tied to the camera and, and kind of um, interpreted as a walkthrough and animation. So the video you saw was our first prototype of the application. We have now considerably uh, improved the realism of the scene. We also think that this would be a very uh, good application to test where people want to um, design a landscape, a full-fledged landscape with surfaces, with trees, with plants, and at the same time uh, analyze, um, analyze ecological relevance on the tangible models, such as erosion, such as water flow, and such as groundwater, um, groundwater management. Uh, so, uh, so um, all this, uh, what you saw, is open source. Uh, so we have it on GitHub, uh, also on Open Science Framework. Um, uh, then, if you would be interested in actually building this, uh, this is a, a list of uh, this is basically budget what you need. 
uh, depending on uh, if you already have a computer which you can run it with or a projector, this can be actually pretty cheap. Uh, it can be a little bit do-it-yourself do uh, project if you want. Um, and uh, we have resources on our website uh, and wiki. And there is also a book and an article uh, about this uh, new um, edition, the Immersive Tangible Landscape. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Please stop by the booth uh, if you want to interact with the tangible model um, there physically and also uh, immersive environment. Any yeah. questions? Yeah. I think so. Sorry? Oh. The, the list of price, uh, the parts and prices. Yeah, I think we have that. Yeah. Um, uh, and we have um, we have several uh, presentations, and they usually uh, involve there is a, the list of, with the budget. So um, we will put this online as well. So, and right. you have you are free. Feel free to stop by at the booth. We have some materials there as well. Um, so the question is, if you need to actually have the tangible landscape to be able to use the immersive environment, you can use your GIS data uh, without tangible landscape to make the, to, to make the coupling with uh, with immersive. Yes, you can do that. So the uh, the Blender environment is now directly. Um, so the the file handling and the monitoring module receives any type of data. So you can put your own GIS data, even created from ArcGIS. Uh, but it wouldn't be as robust because because basically you have time normally when you design something and you can put it in the GIS environment. Whereas with the tangible landscape, because it's real time, so you can really reduce the iterations of changing a landscape and landscape change into the immersive environment. But yes, if you have a simulation, that simulation would be very useful. For instance, you can export automatically patches um, and then those patches could be translated into trees or the surface change or any, any simulation you want. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, so if we were thinking about using HoloLens, right? That's the question, basically. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So this is this is basically tangible, immersive virtual reality, and now there would be this augmented reality, right? So, uh, so we were thinking about it, but not in very specific terms yet. Uh, the technology is not very stable. Uh, and uh, it would be uh, quite difficult to integrate it at this point. Uh, but uh, we are definitely looking into the future, and we are always looking for you know new technologies, better scanners, and stuff like that. Oh yeah, so uh, Geo, Geo for all is, uh, uh, let's see, um, it's uh, initiative, yeah, that's the word I want. <laughs> Geo for all is an initiative, uh, it's based on uh, OSGEO, um, and um, it's, a, uh, it's several, it's actually more than 100 laboratories all over the world, uh, which are focusing on uh, education, uh, geospatial education with uh, open data, open source software. Uh, and uh, if you want to uh, know more about uh, geo for all uh, you should find uh, my advisor, Dr. Helena Mitashova, uh, because she is the head of the 
uh, geo for all initiative within North uh, America.